Hello and welcome to episode 73 of the Your Next Chapter podcast. This is Angela Raspis. Now today I'm having a wholehearted conversation with a couple of very key colleagues and the subjects and topics that we are delving into today revolve around client attraction and revenue generation incredibly important parts, obviously, of growing, building, expanding a sustainable next chapter business. Now, the two ladies I have on the line with me are Christy Smith. Now, Christy is the founder of Virtual Elves, and she's worked over the last 10 years with hundreds of businesses, helping them develop strategies and methods and tools for effective outsourcing. She really shows us how outsourcing allows you to scale and grow and be profitable. And I'd like to add to that, stay in your zone of genius so that you can let go of the task that could be having you really busy all the time but not necessarily gaining traction. I'm a customer of Christie's and I think her service is fabulous. And then of course the gorgeous Kelly O'Brien. Kelly's an author and a speaker and a blogger who really specializes in social media and online marketing. In particular, she shows you how to move what we both call your most aligned clients from that piece where they discover you right through investing in you. And she does that by helping you use storytelling and strategy and systems. She has a phenomenal background as a journalist and as a PR consultant in her own agency and brings so much wisdom to this client attraction conversation. So what we're delving into here is first and foremost, looking at our business models and contrasting how when you have different business models, they bring with them different ways in which you will attract, convert, and gain revenue from your clients. We'll look at one-to-one versus margin-based versus leveraged type of business models. And I want you to consider where do you fit in? And in particular, here how we have pivoted and evolved over time as we see how the market is changing and how, our, and how our clients within that market are also indicating that they have different needs. Really important, that responsiveness to market. We look at lead generation pipelines and how I really believe you need yeah, between three and six. So if one closes, you're not left in the lurch. And look for the story that I, that I tell on this podcast about what happened to someone who was relying only on referrals. We talk about the role that experience and confidence play in sales conversations because it is so important for you to actually own your value and ask for the sale. And we reveal how there is no need for script shame if that's what you're using at the beginning of your sales journey. Other things that are coming up in particular is the role that nurturing and education play versus direct selling and that there is a time for both of those. So lots and lots of goodies here. As always, I really encourage you to have a pen and paper, not obviously if you're driving, but don't just listen. Decide which pieces you will take action on because that's what I want for you, traction and growth in your business, not just learning as much as I adore that. Now, there is a free download in association with this episode that takes you through 21 kickstart ideas for you to start focusing on those revenue generating excuse me, actions that you can take in your business. We do talk about how things take time, but yes, there are actions you can start prioritizing today that will bring those clients and therefore that revenue towards you. To get that download, simply go to angelaraspis.com forward slash 73, that's number seven, number three, and the word download. And I hope that you find that really useful. But now, Settle in, have a listen to this conversation, and as I said, decide where you will take action to see what can unfold in your next chapter. Inspiration, clarity, confidence, and wholehearted business strategy. Welcome to Your Next Chapter, the podcast especially for women in their 40s and beyond who know that business and personal development go hand in hand. Tune in each week for marketing, mindset, and personal growth strategies along with inspiring stories from women around the world who are creating new businesses and lives that are personally fulfilling and financially rewarding. If you're looking to create a business and life you love, you're in great company. Let's find out what will unfold in your next chapter. I'm your host, Angela Raspis, and I'm so delighted that you're here. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Your Next Chapter podcast. This is Angela Raspis, your host, and today I'm joined by two fantastic colleagues who are going to be having this three-way conversation all about the art of client attraction and generating cash flow for your business and how important that is for growth 
and sustainability. I'm joined by the gorgeous Kelly O'Brien and Christy Smith, who are going to be unpacking their business models and the way that they generate leads into their businesses. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. It's great to have you here. Well, before we, before we hit uh, record on this episode, when we we're in the, the green room, so to speak, talking about this, the main thing that we want um, you as our listener to understand today is the importance for you to focus on lead generating activities, on revenue generating activities. There are so many aspects to our businesses that we need to take care of on a day-to-day basis. Sometimes it's easy to hide behind the things that keep us busy and feel satisfying, like tweaking websites and tweaking branding and shifting things around on our desk. But at the end of the day, that need for us to actually put ourselves out there and ask for people to get involved in our business, ask for people to invest in the services and the products that we provide. And that can feel a bit scary. Now, we're talking today about business models and the different ways in which we generate our revenue, but also want to touch on on the different lead generation pipelines that you can follow and also that reality that there isn't a magic button that you can push and go, voila, all the clients are here now. So we're going to have a, a real conversation about what it takes to generate those clients. So I want to dive in, guys, about the type of business models that you have and how you go around generating your clients at the moment. So let's talk about the business models first. So, Kelly, what's the way in which people work with you? What's your service and business model? Sure. So I guess for me, um, most of my clients are one-on-one coaching clients. That's the majority of my work. I do have a little bit of done-for-you work, but most of it is um, uh, people are attracted to me because they want um, client pathways um, or, or soulful sales funnels, I guess, and systems set up in their business. And most of that is done through coaching and and for me it's not about doing one-off sessions because it's very hard to get anyone a result in just a one-off session I generally work with people four to six months and for some people uh, some businesses I've started working with them and and a year later they couldn't imagine me not being on their team so it does vary but um, for me it's more about long-term strategy Oh, absolutely. I love that. There's two things that I pick up on there when you're talking about that is that quite often it can be easier. I'm, I'm doing the, the quotation marks around those words as we speak. It can be easier to have someone agree to work with you on a one-off basis because the investment point is obviously lower. The time investment is lower as well. But as you've just touched on, the, the necessity of investing over a longer time period to bring a more sustained result because there isn't that magic switch. So that's great for the client and they see you as part of their team. But the reverse First side to that is also true that you will be getting a larger chunk of revenue, which is more growth focused for your for your business as well. Yes, that's right. Exactly. It stops you having to um, move into, and I guess this comes into the marketing, but moving into push based selling because it's about numbers and about trying to get as many clients as you can, and and swaps you to getting quality clients who want to work with you for a longer period of time, which of course helps you with your own consistency when it comes to the income side of things as well. And that's a key word, isn't it? Consistency. That's what we want with our income. It's so important. And that that push-based marketing that you just touched on, I'm going to revisit that because uh, it's important for us to get that balance between the push and the pull. And sometimes we do have to push, but often we have to invite and to pull. So thank you for highlighting that one. And let's just jump over to Christy for a moment. So Christy, talk to us about the business model that you have. How do you bring clients and cash flow into your business? Yeah, so interestingly enough, parts of what uh, Kelly was just saying there also uh, flow through my business model. So my business model is more of a margin-based model. It's definitely um, offering that higher price point, getting the quality clients in for the, you know, longevity of the uh, sort of the working relationship. It's not, you know, churning through clients and trying to you know, get as many leads and as many clients through as possible on the low price point. So it's not a one-on-one situation. Um, it's it's a service business. We have 
you know, a, a group of virtual assistants that our clients, I will lead them in and then guide them through to the service that they're, they're then going to work for, hopefully for the long term. So, you know, th- for me, it's important that the margin I- is large enough that it warrants then the work that's involved in, you know, paying paying the virtual assistants what they're worth and making sure that the client is also getting getting a decent arrangement out of it. It's that three three way win situation. Absolutely. So and and I use your services, so I'm a very happy customer. But yes, <laughs> that that margin that needs to sit there needs mm. to also cover the marketing costs. I think a lot of us talk about, oh, this is the revenue that I'm generating. And although we're not going this discussion, get a drill down into accounting and bookkeeping and expenses, reconciliation, all that stuff that makes my, my eyes sort of crinkle up and I have to hand it over to my own bookkeeper. But the idea is um, that is often out of the marketplace, which I think is a little misleading, is when we hear particularly about launches and things like that, where people have made, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on a launch, but that's the revenue. It's not the profit. And we really Mm. need to get clear between the two. And in that margin-based business that you're talking about, that margin that you create needs to be enough to not only pay you some revenue, but also cover those marketing expenses that it took to generate that um, new client in the first place. Yeah, and I think you need to balance it, right? And you need to make a decision um, based around, well, what do you want it to be? And it, it really can be one of two things. You can actually really drill your marketing and drill your lead generation and have the volume coming through at a lower price point. And, you know, you can still not necessarily have the higher margin, but the volume creates the profit for you. Or you can decide to, you know, not do that, have a more boutique solution um, with the higher price point, the quality clients. And, but of course, the price needs to basically, you know, reflect what, what you're doing in that respect, because you're not going to have the volume. Mm, right, that's a really important point. And this, this comes to positioning as well, making a decision as to where we want to sit in the market. Both of you guys have talked about the desire to attract the quality clients, which is exactly the same desire that I have. But, but, but how do you define quality? Kelly, what, what does that mean to you in terms of a quality client? Um, it's someone who is... <sighs> who understands the value of what you can provide to them. So it's um, it's such a hard thing to be able to explain, but I guess it's getting people who you know that when you work with them, they're going to take action and that what you do, they completely value what you do. And um, I guess the way that you, um, it's kind of getting into that place where you can attract people who are tire kickers, who don't value what you do, who are there to try and get a quick win. And when people fully understand what it is and how what you do works, um, money doesn't become it doesn't become as important to them as the value that they're getting. So they're not there thinking about how much they've just spent with you and um, what sort of return they've got on it. They're more interested in. Um, what you're actually providing to them and the service that you're giving them. So for me, it's someone who doesn't want to spend $7 on something and expect um, a magic pill. That's someone who knows that it's going to take time because um, getting clients and, and, and doing marketing isn't something that you flick a switch and overnight something works. You have to be able to have the space and energy to be able to test things and see what works for you and then modify things as you're going along because things do change. Um, there's no quick fixes out there, no matter what some of the marketers might tell you um, and some of the things that we're being um, sold. It's, it's really, really hard to just have a, um, something that's going to work overnight. I think that's very fair and us um, bringing in that idea that the cost or the investment of the service is not the only criteria. We never want, want to be reduced in the, the sort of business models that all three of us have. We never want to be reduced to just a, a price comparison. You know, we've, got, we've got more premium positioning on what it is that we're providing the market and that will dictate price and that will dictate often the number of clients that you need within your model. I certainly prefer a high intimacy model and I'll talk a little about mine in a moment that allows those more discerning clients, those clients that are ready to invest in themselves, as you've described it, the ones that that understand and appreciate the value that you offer and, and are willing to take action. So, so important. And how about yourself, Christy? What is it to you in terms of defining, I call it a most aligned client or a quality client. What is it for you that really ticks the boxes in an ideal client? 
Yeah, look, it's really interesting. For me particularly, um, there has to be a values alignment and that's why I always have a conversation with a potential client in the very first instance. I'll never let them go through our services until I've asked them a couple of questions that lets me know what their mind is thinking and what, what sort of mindset they're coming into, um, I guess, experience exploring using a VA um, with. So, you know, if they're asking, if, if I'm talking to them and the first question they ask is, look, how much do your VAs cost? Instantly, I know where the head is at. And I know that they're not focused on what what this VA is going to give them um, by going through the process. And I know that they're shopping around. Um, I'm not interested in people necessarily that are shopping around on price. I don't mind people shopping around uh, to find the right fit. Um, The people that tell me they've looked at my website or they've looked at something and they connected with me, I know that they've taken the time and I know that they're looking at this from a long-term point of view. So there's, you know, there's a couple of questions that I get out of it. Really for me, I want them to respect and value, um, I, I guess, respect and value our values and I make those very clear on our website, uh, you know, in working with offshore workers. You know, it's one of the things that people have quite a, a stigma about and can be, you know, they can treat them like they're a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a worker bee, workhorse type thing and don't give them respect. So if I can feel the respect straight away in how they're talking about that VA as a service, then I know that they're going to value what we're putting in place for them. That's a great point and I love the way that you mentioned how you communicate that on your website Mm -hmm. and our websites are selling tools, they're education tools, they're communicating, as you've said, the values that are important to you because a service delivery is a partnership, it's a collaboration. We get invested Mm -hmm. in our clients and although we're not responsible obviously for their results because there's so many different pieces that fit into that puzzle, we want to support them and so I think it's important for us to look at our website's Try and look at it with a a beginner's eye and say, what sort of message, what sort of values am I projecting? Because I really believe that our messaging should... um should put people off as much as it attracts people towards us. So having having clarity on who we want to work with and how we can help so that people could read our messaging and either go, yes, I resonate with this, this makes sense to me, I feel drawn towards it versus, yeah, that's not my style. I'm really happy if someone recognises that I'm not their style because I want them to find someone that fits well with them and that's definitely not always me. Do you guys feel the same way? Definitely. We yeah, had completely. It. 100%. Yay, we've got 100% on that one. So action point number one, go and read your website and see if it reflects clearly your brand values so that you can start having conversations with people who feel the same way. Okay, well, well, that concept that we were talking about before of the business models, I just want to unpack mine a little bit as well, because I certainly want to point out that our business models evolve over time, the ways in which we attract and create revenue evolve over time. Is it fair to say that the way that you guys have built your businesses, Kelly, if you look at yours now versus say three or four years ago, has there been a shift in the way that you do um, generate revenue in the business? Oh, for sure. I know back in the beginning, my business started out um, back in about 2010 as a PR agency. And so I was doing very much done for you work at a very, very low rate, much lower than it should have been. But of course, that was all about self-worth and lots of other issues. That's a completely different topic. Um, So for me, yes, it was. And then I moved into this idea of digital sales and that I loved the concept of um, being able to do courses and all those sorts of things, which worked really well back then and it was much easier to sell a course. I think it's harder now in this market. Um, People are looking for um, a more intimate relationship. They're looking for more um, one-on-one with a person as opposed to going through a course. And I think a lot of that has been driven by um, the statistics that, you know, I think 4% of people ever finish a course. Um, people realise that um, the accountability is the part that miss- is often missing in a lot of those digital programs. Some of them still really work well, but um, the sales aren't the same as they used to be. So for me, it did change from 
from done for you work through to um, doing a lot of digital courses and, and, and those sorts of things now into um, the coaching model. So definitely. Uh, and that's that point about the 4% of people finish, finishing courses. I do remember going through a little bit of um, a stock take a couple of years ago <laughs> and looking on the hard drive and finding all the courses that I had invested in in the past. And I have to admit, I'm probably a part of that 4% on very <laughs> occasionally, very occasionally. I think it's easy. We, we get that feeling. Of, I've heard the expression a lot about FOMO, that fear of missing out if we mm -hmm. don't you know, do this course or get that thing. But I remember reading a blog post a while ago that made perfect sense, and I've shared it with my own clients since, the difference between just-in-time and just-in-case learning. So mm -hmm. just in case is where you've got that FOMO, like, oh, look, I might want to build my own membership site one day, so maybe I should take that course because <laughs> it's on special versus that I have a specific skill that I want to develop. For me this year, it's around storytelling, story branding. So I'm investing in, in um, coaching around that area for me. Um, and I know that's something I want to bring into my business, so it makes sense to invest in that. But, yeah, I've certainly seen a shift in the, in the market as well, and sometimes that market shift will dictate our evolution but sometimes you can see it happening and you'll move beforehand so you've gone from done for you to digital to that more intimacy high touch so there's been a definite evolution there so thanks for sharing yeah. that definitely and, and i think and, also, oh, sorry if i can no, just um, um, I, I guess one thing on the, the digital side also one part of it can be bright shiny object syndrome that you're just doing it because of that fear of um, either yeah. missing out or, or it's oh look something new um, but the other side of it is sometimes we're in a stage of, of our business where we're not, we don't have the income capacity to get something that is higher touch we, we, we need to keep moving our business forward and sometimes those um, digital courses are an easier access for us depending on our own stage of business. So I think that um, can also factor into it as well as another reason that people might go down that particular path. So, um, That's a really good point and thank you so much for making it because I don't want to be sitting here and, and, and saying, well, you should only ever invest in high touch you know, one on one because, yeah, it's not always possible. And I certainly have been in my own business evolution yeah, there's been times when cash flow has been very tight and there was a need to develop a skill that I could not develop alone and I didn't have the ability to outsource that in terms of to a supplier partner, so I needed to upskill. So, yes, really good point and I appreciate you making that. And, Christy, if we pop down to you, to you, how have you seen the evolution of your own business? I remember us meeting so many years ago at a Working Women's Network event. But so what have, what have you seen in terms of how you've changed your model or or refined your model as you've gone through? Yeah, look, I think I've, I've done a lot of refining. And I think, you know, when I did start over 10 years ago, um, I, I think I was very naive. I was very naive in business. I was sort of just following a lot of what other people were doing in the industry and just trying to keep up and be competitive um, with that. And it took me probably about six years before I realised that a lot of people actually have a lot of frustrations with what other competitors are doing in the industry and I needed to actually answer those frustrations and change what I was doing. So, you know, my my offering, my service offering changed from being quite restrictive, which is what most of the businesses were. You know, they, they had restrictions on 20 hours per week for virtual assistance, even though the price was low. You had to commit for three months. You were signed into a contract. You had to pay an onboarding fee that was usually about $250. And so all of those restrictions were really... I guess, hampering small businesses and stopping them from taking that step and exploring outsourcing and what that might do for their business. So as I then started to get into the education space and educating entrepreneurs through groups like the Entourage and, and um, the Business Blueprint, I, I found that if I just removed all of those barriers and I removed all of those things and made it completely flexible so that people could access me no matter what their level, it might actually encourage them to step in and actually get more for themselves. And so that I, I did that sort of two years ago and it's been fantastic. Now, 
yes, it doesn't necessarily help me from a, a, a business profit point of view um, in getting the bigger clients all the time. But what it does is it brings the little clients in the door. Like Kelly was saying, sometimes they've got to start somewhere because they don't have that income to support the bigger picture, which they've got the vision to, to support it. They just don't have the income. If I can start them at that ground roots and let them come in for two hours you know, a week or for whatever that is without any restrictions, maybe they'll turn into that 20-hour-a-week client, which a couple of my clients have. So, yeah, that's, that's sort of the change that I've seen is trying to be flexible within the industry and get rid of the barriers that allow people to actually explore what outsourcing actually is for them. I love that because that now makes our real salient point number two, which is listen to your market and to, and to respond to what it's telling you. So I think, I think it's fair to say that when we're starting out our businesses, we look for a way shower. We look for, okay, how can I, how can I model this? What services am I going to offer? It's, it's unusual for us to start completely from scratch without looking at anything, taking inspiration from anywhere. So it's not surprising those first years, you looked at the market, you saw a need, you responded with a similar response to what um, other organizations were offering. But then you mm -hmm. got smart. You really began to see where the gap was and you pivoted and change your services to meet that need. And, yeah, I've, I've certainly benefited from that, from the flexibility that you offer. So that's a key mm. point, guys. It, it's to look at and listen to what your market is asking for. Are you able to introduce something new or just change the angle on it so that you, you almost are meeting a niche within the niche that you can take good care of? So that's a great point. Well, um, and if I talk about my own evolution, when I came out of my marketing agency back in 2012, burnt out and exhausted and swearing that I would never touch another <laughs> marketing plan <laughs> for as long as I lived. And that, and that lasted for 12 months. I only did life coaching for about 12 months. And that was very high intimacy. That was one-on-one. -on -one. That was six months of intense fortnightly coaching with me. And I think I was going to head for another burnout again. But no, seriously, <laughs> what I realized was that um, although I did love that and, and I had moved a long way away from strategy because I just needed a break, when people started talking about but I've been thinking of starting a business. I'd sort of get all excited and, and I had to recognize that, you know, my love of business is so strong. So that's how I pivoted and, and created this model that really combined the two. We're providing the marketing side, but also the mindset, you know, the confidence side. But in terms of the services that I was offering, I certainly started where I recommend most service owners need to or service providers should start. And that's with the one-on-one -on -one work. It allows you to only need to get one yes at a time. Some people have that desire to move straight into group programs and look, all power to them, but I certainly wouldn't start myself there because it meant that I needed to get half a dozen yeses in terms of, yes, I want to work with you all at the same time. So the one-on-one -on -one work not only allowed me to get a client and work with them, it allowed me to hone my method, uh, my signature system, the way that I take people from where they are to where they want to be. But I think it was um, about three years ago now, and it was from my own personal experience in the recovery movement outside of business where working in small groups and really sharing what was going on for you had such a massive impact on me. I decided to bring that into my business and I slowly pivoted to a point where originally my revenue was 75% from one-on-one -on -one work to now 70% 70, 75% 70 mastermind work was those small groups you know very high intimacy a decent level of investment and commitment long term from clients but a, a very different model and now so my model sits with the with the the masterminds at two different levels depending on where someone is and after, underneath that set retreats and underneath that set strategy sessions so very much um, a little tiny bit of one-on-one -on -one, but the majority of work in the in the group scenario and that's uh that's a model that's worked beautifully for me and I absolutely adore working in it so I've pivoted over time as well as I've experienced what works for me as well as what works for my clients and I think that's something that we need to look at is our clients are vital. Obviously, they're the heartbeat of our business, but we need to make sure that the services that we provide are actually things that light us up as well, that have us working in our zone of genius where we've got all of that energy and that focus. What's been your experience there in terms of working in such a way that it complements your skill set? Christy, what are your thoughts there? 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you and I catch up quite often and, and I think that's the epitome of what I, what I want my business to represent. You know, I, I really want there to be lots and lots of space in, in my daily life. I want to run a business that is making a huge impact on both the business owners that I'm working with and the virtual assistants over in the Philippines, which is a, a developing country. You know, I see what we're able to provide them by offering this platform for them to work for us and work for our clients. And, you know, I think if I had to be head down, totally focused on a daily basis in the doing of my business and, and doing all the bits, the, the, you know, the one-on-one -on -one bits and pieces, that the, the mundane work in the business, I, I just don't think it would work for me. So for me, the importance is what can I do? What can I do to continue to grow the business, to continue to bring in the leads, to continue to do all of that? without actually impacting on my space, my time and the efforts that I'm trying to, to build, you know. And I think um, we are talking about that from the perspective of uh, actually finding out where your leads are coming from and then focusing on that. And I think Kelly said that, you know, that can change over time as well. It's not the same all the time. Um, and we've shown the shift in that. But for me now... I've pushed all of my networking away. I've, you know, I don't have this, you know, FOMO going on anymore. I've pushed it all away. I'm focusing in one particular entrepreneur group because I know that at the moment 80% of my business is coming from there and it's quite lucrative. So why would I bother with everything else if that's where it is and I'm allowed to have that space still by doing that and the leads are still coming in? And that's wonderful that you, because I'd say space and flexibility is definitely one of your values and you want yeah. that for your clients, you want that for your VAs, you want that for yourself. And so making mm. choices that allow that to happen within your business model is so important. Mm. And we will, we'll move on to uh, lead generation pipelines and what's working, what isn't in just a moment. I'll just pop to Kelly for a second, see what's her feeling on designing your business model around yourself just as much as your clients. Um, I guess I have a very similar story to you in that when I was in my PR business, I was overwhelmed and I burnt out as well. And it's because I was doing that done for you work and there's no scalability in that unless you bring on staff or have team members. So I brought on team members and um, it didn't change anything. It just still uh, kept me in a space of burnout and overwhelm. So um, I realised that it was very heavy for me. Um, and I know that that works, you know, so the done for you model works for some people, but for me it didn't. It just always felt heavy um, and I didn't enjoy what I was doing. And obviously I was also doing PR, which was my zone of excellence, but not my zone of genius. So for me, um, doing, you know, strategy systems and, and storytelling is um, far more align for me and doing the coaching model as well means that I can scale my business a little bit more. I've got more space. Um, and also it allows me to still get um, clients a result because we meet fortnightly. They also have um, light email support between that time as well. So for me, it doesn't feel heavy. And for the client, they're still able to get the results that they want to be able to achieve in their business as well. So I think that's where I've come to and that's been an evolution as we've talked about. Um, it's not something that um, just magically, you know, magically arrived at this place. Um, it was feedback and I do a lot of, if anyone's ever been a client, I do a lot of surveys in my business and I take a lot of notes when someone gets on a sales conversation with me as well to tr really find out um, what's someone's style of learning um, and implementing as well and how that aligns with um, the offers that I have and how I've evolved those over time. That's great. And that, that I think one of the, the key messages that I'm hearing in here from both of you is we're talking about sustainable businesses, not fly by night, not flash in the pan. So it's really important to recognize that a business model that on paper or on website or on story for somebody else is not necessarily going to be the one that fits for you. So there is that allowing of that evolution and being aware of what's working, what's not, what feels good, what doesn't, what gets results, what doesn't, and to make those pivots and those evolutions from there. I mean, the same thing, with me when I had my marketing agency, I had a team of four full-time staff. So it had been scaled, 
but it still didn't delight because of the intensity of that done for you. Hence why I moved into a new model. So yeah, I intend to be here for the long haul. So I need to protect my energy mm. as, as much as anything else. Well, let's, let's talk about the actual way. We've talked about our models. We've talked about how that's evolved and how what we're doing now fits us. We'll probably be different again if we came back and had this conversation in a couple of years' time. There'd be other tweaks and pivots as we learn more about what's working and what, and what can be changed. So let's talk about the way in which we actually attract clients into our business since we know how we're creating that revenue. Now, I'm a big believer that you need multiple lead generation pipelines in most instances until you're working out which are the ones that work best for you and then you can turn up the flow. I think three or four at a, as a minimum is really important. I've, I've certainly seen clients in the professional services field that have lo- relied primarily on referrals, which are very difficult to, inverted commas, control. And a particular client who had three core referrers, one who retired, one who left the country, and one who died. And suddenly, <laughs> they're a bit like, true story. <laughs> so their ability to, to create new clients was suddenly incredibly compromised. So we need to make sure that I believe we have these other pipelines you know, going along in the background at the very least so that we can switch them on, switch them off, you know, dial them up, dial them down, depending on what our needs are. So let's talk about the ways in which you bring clients into your own business. Christy, let's, let's talk about you. I know that you said that you've done this analysis and you've seen that an enormous amount of your leads are coming from a particular group. So it makes sense to push a load of your energy there. But talk to us about lead generation and how perhaps it goes from discovery through to um, actually engaging with you. Yeah, look, you know, and again, you know, it's been an evolution. It hasn't always been this way. It's probably only the last two years. And, you know, I think the longer you are in business and the more you do the hard work uh, and get around and be visible everywhere, I think visibility is probably the biggest way to generate leads. Get yourself out there in the first, you know, couple of years of of running the business. You know, be seen everywhere. Be seen as the expert. Um, you know, I did a lot of hard yards. I, I think the first year that I started the business, Angela, which was when we met, you know, I, I can't tell you how many networking events I actually turned up at and handed out hundreds and hundreds of business cards just for people to know who I was. Um, but And I didn't see anything come from that until probably six months after that when people then started to go, oh, okay, I've seen Christy a few times and so you're front of mind. So for me, networking was a massive one in the early stages, being seen, everybody knew who I was. I, you know, I, I basically um, found lots of different networks so that anytime somebody posted in a Facebook group about a VA, somebody else would put my name in there. I didn't even have to do it. You know, that's always, that's always a benefit. Um, Very nice. Yeah, I know. I know. I was pretty, pretty lucky in that respect. And, but, but again, my business is 10 years old. It's taken me a long time to actually get to the point where I can rely on that. Um, The other thing that I did a lot of was, picking some really, really good uh, referral partners or referral groups. Um, I spent a lot of time in those groups and with those groups and doing, you know, lots of um, podcast, not podcasts at that stage. It was more sort of video interviews and, you know, masterclasses and things like that. So giving my time for free in order to put my face out there and to have different communities know who I was and what my expertise was. And, you know, that that's always been really lucrative for me as well. And that has then led to a couple of those groups white labeling my services, which is another added benefit you know, and and giving them referral benefits from, you know, from doing doing those joint venture relationships as well. But, yeah, look, Angela, you said about the, um, you know, the entourage. Um, for me now, you know, just picking a group, just picking a group where I can have a lot of influence. Um, I, can, I can influence them through education, which is probably one of my biggest channels at the moment is educating through education because I'm giving so much out. There's that feeling of then them getting a lot for free, for free 
and then not even thinking about anybody else when they go to needing the services because they've already received the value. That's a great point. It's about staying top of mind. And I want to touch on that concept of the sales cycle because I think sometimes we can be a little impatient about the results. Like as, you know, when we plant a seed, we've got to spend time watering it and make sure it's got sunlight and nurturing. And and if the seed's not growing quickly, we don't abuse the seed and say, for God's sake, grow faster. I need you now. (laughs) We recognize that there's a cycle to it. And such with sales as well. I mean, I believe that you people, if you're thinking about the cycle overall, people start with being unaware that they've even got a niche. Then they become aware that there's a problem or a niche. And then they become aware and willing to do something about it. And then they become aware and willing and they begin the research. And then they get to the stage where they're now evaluating the, the options to solve or address the problem. And then they start having conversations and purchase. Mm-hmm. And I know that that sales cycle, sometimes it's really fast. I'm thirsty. Hmm. I'll walk into that shop and buy a Coke versus I've been thinking about a new car and it takes, you know, my husband researches, good God, for a couple of years. But um, <laughs> that, sales, that sales cycle can vary enormously. And what you've just said there, that you influence through education and you deliver value so that you stay top of mind. You're putting mm. in that, that time to be viewed and be positioned as the expert. And mm. that, that takes time. And so once people are at that point where they're looking to purchase you're a part, you're on, their, you're on their list as possibility. Mm. That's what we want. And that's why I think the point that you made about the visibility is so, so important to make sure that you are in the, what I call watering holes of your, yeah. those most aligned clients so that they see you. Uh, I really appreciate you explaining the investment of time that you took. I do have a little resource that we'll be providing later on in the show that gives you some kickstart ideas that can make things happen a little more quickly, but recognizing that underneath that is a bedding down of long-term strategies to to give that Mm -hmm. visibility. And it's research. It's research in working out. You, you, You need to know where your people are hanging out and that's where you need to go. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I I guess a good example, if we're just thinking of social media for a moment, and and I know Kelly will certainly have some great thoughts to add to this, is Pinterest is apparently a place where my people hang out. But I do not at this point in time, I don't have the evidence that that is, is leading to the conversations and the high intimacy of my model. So I've had to hit the pause button on that and make decisions elsewhere where my watering holes are so it's it's where they are and it's your um time and desire and i guess some um, skill set to actually play in that watering hole as well so it does take research for sure mm. thank you madame and, and kelly let's have your thoughts here so how do people find you how have you created your lead generation pipelines and how do you bring people towards you for that client attraction process well, I guess um, following on from what Christy was saying, people don't don't make an impulse buy with me. <laughs> You're not going to um, invest in coaching and it's not an impulse buy. So it is a long, longer term strategy. And I have, um, my business actually started because um, I had, I was a newspaper journalist and I was writing a mum column. Um, and when I went on maternity leave for the second time, I started a mum blog, not really knowing what a mum blog was. And there's someone who um, I became friends with as a, as a mum blogger back then. So this is, you know, nine years ago. Um, and she became a client last year and it's taken her nine years <laughs> to become a client. <laughs> That's the extreme. Um, most people don't take nine years, but it does show um, the value of um, providing people with education and, and, um, and, and value value first. So for me, I guess starting as a blogger meant that I was always giving value. Um, I didn't uh, understand back in the early days that you had to actually ask for the sale as well. Um, I just thought you could give, 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 and eventually someone would just come and, um, and buy from you or, or invest in you. Um, and that obviously changes over time. But for me, the blogging thing has been particularly important because it is my... Uh, one, I'm a writer. Having been a journalist for 16 years, writing is my core and also storytelling because I know the power of um, a story, that if I can share a story, I can allow people to understand what it is that um, that I do and understand what it would be like to work with me before they even invest in me. So those things have become really important to attract people 
And as we've talked about with the buying cycle, I can create pieces of content in my blog that tailor to people at different points in their buying cycle, depending on whether they're um, just becoming aware of me, whether they're in research phase or whether they're in that stage of actually um, comparing me to someone else because they're ready to invest. Um, and obviously, the core of my business is, of course, um, client pathways and helping people um, set up um, systems that allow them to move from um, discovering who you are online, so whether that's um, Facebook or SEO or, or however someone finds you, um, through to investing with you. So for me, it's really important um, to, one, understand where my ideal client is hanging out, which we just um, mentioned before, but it has to be both a place where my ideal client is hanging out and can hear the message. And number two, it has to be something that I enjoy doing because if I show up uh, doing Pinterest and I really hate Pinterest, that will come through. And Pinterest is a bit different because it's more SEO based than um, than community and, and storytelling sometimes. But um, when we're looking at things like Facebook or Twitter or um, LinkedIn, if you hate being on LinkedIn, don't do it because people will see that you hate doing LinkedIn. Um, so for me, it's a, it's a balance of both, um, figuring out where your ideal client's hanging out, figuring out what you love to do um, for, that aware, for that awareness stage. And then it's about trying to um, capture people's details. So for me, when someone comes to my website, only um, you know one percent of those people are ever going to um, are going to buy on the first instance, and that's not going to be coaching that they invest in. So um, it's about capturing their details and then creating that nurturing relationship with someone. So again, it's about providing value that I have um, a nurturing email sequence that both gives value through sharing blog posts and whatever that might be um, to also then inviting them to work with me because, as I said, you've got to ask for the sale eventually. So that's um, one of my core um, core pipelines, I guess, and the way that people get to know me is that they tend to Google um, or they're hanging out on Facebook and notice a Facebook ad and then they're invited to a piece of content and from that they then um, – become part of my database and are nurtured through to the sale. So that is one. And then obviously they fill in a form and um, get on a call with me. Um, for me, there's two parts to that pipeline. One is that they can either give me an investment of um, money to start with. And as I said, for a lot of my people, if they don't know who I am, then it's going to be hard to invest in coaching straight away. So they might invest in a smaller um, product, you know, a 47 or a $97 product that's, um, going to allow them to taste me and see whether or not they like who I am and whether they align with that. Um, and the other part is time. So they might get on a webinar and invest their time or they might get on a phone conversation with me and invest their time there to be able to figure out whether I'm the right fit for them and whether they're the right fit for me as well. So that's number one of my pipelines. Um, number two is in Tasmania where I um, moved from two years ago. There was no networking there and I think the only one was probably the Chamber of Commerce. So um, I didn't do a lot of face-to-face -face networking in Tasmania but since I've moved to uh, Wollongong, which is south of uh, Sydney, uh, since I've been here, women's networking is massive here. So I've had to be really strategic about um, where I want to invest my time because for me, time is more precious than money um, in a lot of ways. And so I've found a particular networking group that I align with um, and I've become a VIP sponsor of that. And I've also had some speaking opportunities there as well. So that's um, certainly helped because, um, as we know, converting face-to-face -face is much higher than um, obviously through an email sequence. Um, and the last one's probably been um, speaking as well, just getting the, getting out there on the speaking circuit. And whether it's doing a podcast like this, whether it's speaking in front of a local audience, um, those have been uh, really important to me because I can get my message across and, and share my stories and, and allow people to understand what it is I do um, as opposed to just reading blog posts all the time. And, of course, I have referrals, which we mentioned before, and that's been um, a critical piece as well. But as we talked about, you can't rely on um, referrals and it's not scalable, whereas I know that my um, blogging and my client pathways, that's scalable. I just need to invest more money or do more blogging with better SEO to be able to attract more people into it. Um, with networking, again, um, that's not so scalable because my time is, um, is limited. So they're my four, I guess, four key ways that I attract clients. 
Excellent. And you can see that there is a spread of those. As you're saying, there's, there's that nice mix of when you're out there in person because you're absolutely right. All of the, the marketing stats tell us that the highest conversion happens face-to-face when you can either have a one-on-one conversation with someone literally face-to-face at an event, when you're speaking, that type of thing where people can really feel you, not just understand what it is that you're selling or that you're providing as a service, but they can understand, touching on what um, Christy was saying before, your values, the way you show up, your style, does it resonate? And that's why consistency of your message is so important because people, as we said before, aren't necessarily in the buying stage, but you suddenly appear on their list as a possible. And that's what we're looking for. Good marketing does not close sales. That's a sales conversation. Good marketing opens doors. Good marketing creates leads. And that's what we're looking for. And then it's up to us as conversationalists and as salespeople, which is another hat we need to wear in our businesses to actually close those leads, to, to have that conversation. And as you said so clearly, Kelly, we can nurture and nurture and nurture. And I absolutely value that in my business. But eventually, we have to ask for the sale. And we must not apologize for that fact. I think that too often... We can hide behind the, the nice factor, shall I call it, and the just not being confident in our own value to actually ask for the sale. We're in a business. We're not in a charity. It is essential for us to create revenue. And that means we must give value to create those connections, but then we must step forward and ask for the sale. How have you guys felt about sales conversations? Is it something that came naturally? Is it something that you've needed to work on and nurture it in yourselves? Yeah, I certainly have. Um, look, I, I think for me, and that again has been an evolution, you know, I feel that over time, you, once you become more confident in the product or the service that you're offering and you don't feel like you have to drop your price or you don't feel like you have to have an uncomfortable conversation around your value and, and what you're charging, then it becomes easier and then it it becomes a non-emotional conversation and I think if you can take the emotion, you know, out of the price, <laughs> you know, the, the, the price um, line in the conversation that you're having, you know, I, I know now that I know absolutely without a doubt that the value that I offer, even though the price is higher than what the standard um, VA services out there are offering, I know that without a doubt that when people come to me, they understand the value and the price and it, it goes hand in hand. The price almost doesn't matter because the value that they get in the nurturing and the warmth and the, the you know, what they get from, from us is definitely worth that. So once I realised that I didn't care about what people thought about that and also once I realised I wasn't hungry for anything that walked in the door, I don't know about anybody else, but it's, you know, you're not that, you're not that sort of hungry pre sort of um, scrambling for money type situation where you feel like you have to accept everything and you have to drop your price or you have to justify why you charge what you do. When you get beyond that and that doesn't matter, then the conversation actually just flows without you even realising it. That's a great point. I think when we start off on our, on our journey, sometimes, you know, I can help everyone who's a potential, cli- who's a potential client, everyone yeah. with a pulse. I can help yeah. everyone. <laughs> and no, no, no apologies for that's where we start. This is an evolution. Things mm-hmm. do change over time. But I think um, what I'm hearing with you, Christy, is the certainty that you have and that mm-hmm. owning your value is so important. I think it's a, it's a term that's bandied around a lot. What does it actually mean? Well, for me, it's when you're setting prices. It's whatever the price is and then stretch a little. Anything mm. that does not make you feel resentful about the work that you're doing for the payment that you're receiving and anything that stretches you a little bit so you are motivated to do a fabulous job. There's your price point. Obviously different for everyone. It's something that I help my own clients um, look at, their packaging and their pricing, but it is... To me, it's resentment-led. If you're resenting it, your price is not high enough and you need to certainly have a look at that. But your yeah. certainty is currency. Mm. People come to us as, as experts in our field. They need to know that we can solve the problem. 
And that mm. certainty is a huge part of that conversation. So, so thank you for mm. holding that value so, so strongly. It's a great Just example. If I can add, I, I heard something from um, Glenn Richards, who um, he's the guy that, that runs uh, Glenn Cross Vet uh, Practices and, and is on Shark Tank. Yep. I heard him over the weekend. And the one thing that he said to me is, well, said to everybody. Um, I felt like he was just talking to <laughs> everybody else. Um, but the one thing that he said was people want to be led. They want someone who feels confident and they want to be led. Don't ask them what they want. They're looking for you to give them what they need. So it's, it's, not about, it's not about sitting back and, and, you know, not being confident and wondering what they think. It's, it's this is what I do. This is the expertise that I have. They're looking for a specialist, so you need to give them that. Absolutely. I mean, let's just take the example just before I pop to Kelly. Um, my husband has just been admitted to hospital for a, for a medical um, problem that he has. Now, imagine if the doctor turned around and said, so, got a bit of stomach pain. What do you think we should do about that? <laughs> what are you looking? What are you looking for today, sir? I, mean, I would have been out of that hospital, like, quick, smart. So, so I, true, I know, good analogy. Yes. I know it's an extreme example, but mm. we need to hold our expertise. We have mm. each one of you guys. I know you personally. You know me. We have years of experience to draw upon. We are experts in our field. That doesn't mean we're not learning. I mean, I'm hugely committed mm. to learning and growing and expanding, as I know you guys are as well. But at this point in time, we have the knowledge, we have the ability to solve problems and, and close gaps for people. And we need to stand strongly in that certainty, just like our listeners, you listening to us right now. You have value, you have knowledge that people who started after you are looking for. To please own that value, it is so important. And Kelly, what's been your experience with um, moving in sales conversations? What evolution has taken place there for you? <laughs> oh, look, I was terrible when I started. I just had my little script there that I'd follow <laughs> um, because I just lacked confidence in the sales department and I, I just didn't feel that I was good at it at all. But for me, um, it was more practice, really. You've just got to, got to get out there and just keep doing it. Um, and also, I guess, for me, a large part of the people who get on a sales call with me are warm leads. They're people who have already um, been educated enough that when they get on there, they've already mostly made up their mind of whether they're going to or whether they want to work with me. So for me, out of every five sales conversations, four people might become a client. So um, that takes away the pressure a bit um, and also because they know my values um, before they come on the, the call. So they know what to expect. Um, I guess the other part for me that's changed is um, I now have particular stories that I share during those conversations that I find um, help people understand what it is I can do for them and the value of it and they become more focused on the outcome that they're going to get as opposed to the price that I'm about to tell them. So um, for me, that's been the big shift is that I stop worrying about I have to say this price I mean back in the beginning when I was terrible at it I'd say I'll send you the price after we get off the call because I was too scared to even say it out loud um you know there was just this huge fear and the shakes and all sweats and all those sorts of things <laughs> whereas you know now I've, I've moved past that I've done it enough I know the value as we talked about um of what I do and that I can help people um with their online marketing and their systems and, um, and obviously telling those stories of, of what I can do for them and how their life can be altered and the outcome that they can get because it's about the transformation you can provide, not the um, features and benefits of what you provide. People just want to know um, what the outcome is going to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I remember hearing, just picking up on what you've said there, I was at a conference in Bali a few years ago and one of the speakers described sales as an elegant invitation to transformation. And I went, <laughs> yes, that's it. That's what it is. And I love that. The, the feeling is that, you know, our actions of confidence have got to come before our feelings of confidence. So those first sales calls, those first times when you actually have to take the big gulp and anchor yourself into your value and ask for the sales, terrifying. We all start with scripts. Again, evolution. So no script shame. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's absolutely fine. Well, guys, as we come into the end of this conversation, it's been fantastic. We've talked about our models. We've talked about how our businesses have evolved, how we've responded to what we've seen and heard and felt in the marketplace. We've talked about the importance of having lead generation pipelines that work for our type of business and that align with our skills and, most importantly, those watering holes where those most aligned clients are and and the value of nurturing over time. So not expecting the sale to come automatically, but recognizing that there will be people in our audience, in our community who are ready to buy now. They're at that stage in their cycle. So it is important for us to issue not only the direct invitations, but also the nurturing as well. There's two types of invitations really that we're looking for there. And that it's going to evolve over time. Next, you know, if we, as I said, have this conversation in six months, you may have discovered another watering hole that works for you. But I think consistency, if I was going to make um, an overall recommendation, it's consistency of action. I mean, with myself, my own pipelines, I know conversation is what leads to more clients coming into my world than anything else. When I, when I talk to people, understand where they're at and show how I can help, yeah, that's when I bring people across the line. But before those conversations, there's all sorts of nurturing going on. There's this podcast. There's the masterclasses that I run on a monthly basis about clients and cash flow and marketing. There's the ebook and audio book about confidence. Yeah, there's, there's so many different things that I'm doing in the market that I know connect with the people that I'm looking for. I'm taking a leaf out of your book though, Chrissy, as well, because networking is something that I haven't done a lot of and mm-hmm. knowing in the last couple of years, just from where I am and knowing the impact that that personal connection has, it definitely needs to go on my to-do list as well. So that's an area that I'll be covering off. I'm going to talk about the, um, the resource briefly, but I just wanted to ask you guys, number one, is there any last thoughts that you'd leave our, our listeners with? And number two, how they can find you online. I'll put all your details in the show notes for this episode number 73. But if you can just give us a little verbal as well. Chrissy, if we can start with you, Madonna. Yeah, look, last thoughts. I think it's just important to, to actually sit down in, in your space and think about what you, what, how you want to design your own life. Because how you want to design your life will determine the activities that you do to grow or not your business. And I think once you know what that is, then it makes the decisions very easy to then know where to go to build those leads, to bring in new clients, to manage your profits, you know, all of that sort of stuff. It, it, it will help you understand what needs to happen. It may be that you just sit back and you enjoy what you've actually got right now and not grow. Um, you know, but clients will come in. You just, I think, Angela, what you said, the consistency of your message, of your values, marketing your values, all of that, that consistency across all mediums, you know, be visible in all those different places and, you know, good stuff will come. So that's my parting words. And you can find me at virtual elves, as in the little Santa's elves, uh, .com.au. Fantastic. Thank you, darling. I'll make sure that 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 link is on the page. And yes, very wise word. Let's design (laughs) our lives around our businesses and our businesses around our lives. The two of them have got to sit and be weaved together. I totally agree. (laughs) And Miss Kelly, your parting thoughts and where we can find you in the big wide world. Yeah, sure. I guess um, for me, I guess the the message that I want to give is that there's um, lessons in what you're doing already, what's working and what's not working. I know that data is not a sexy word, but um, if you can look at the the marketing and the model that you have and also um, where people actually come to you from, if you can replicate those channels um, and that's where the consistency comes in, that um, that's how you get to where you want to get to. If you just keep, um, as I say, throwing darts at the marketing map with no real clear plan of what you're doing or no real clear strategy, then um, you'll get where you're going, which might not be where you want to be. So um, it's really about looking at what's working already and how can you replicate that. Um, And as far as finding me, you can go to um, kellyobrien.com.au and um, obviously I'll my business is all about storytelling strategy and systems. 
It is indeed, and you have learned, uh, you have learned, you have taught many a new idea to myself and my clients, um, as both of you have when you've been guest speakers in our masterminds, which I really appreciate the energy and the effort and the time that you guys have invested in my own clients. So thank you so much for that. Ah, so my lovely listeners, I hope that this has been as enjoyable and as enlightening for you as it has been for me whenever I have conversations with these wonderfully successful business women who are growing and evolving and changing and learning each and every day and that's what we want for you as well to share some insights that help you recognize where you are where you want to be and different things you can do to get you there and speaking of that we've talked about consistency we've talked about the need to find those marketing communication channels that connect with the watering holes of your clients and also align with you and there definitely is um, a, a strategy that I teach overall in something that I call the marketing mosaic that looks at there being six core strategies with then 85 different tactics that you can choose between and uh, change that they align better with your skill set that I teach through my masterminds. I don't want to overwhelm you with that at this point. So I just want to give you a snapshot of that. It is a PDF which has 21 kickstart client attraction actions on it. Things that you can look at prioritizing so that you can be doing those revenue new generating activities in your business that are so important now to get the copy of that if you simply go to angelaraspis.com forward slash 73 number seven number three download you'll be taken to a spot where you can opt in and get a hold of that resource just a little asterisk here if you are already a part of my community meaning if you're receiving my newsletter you will get any downloads from the podcast with no need to opt in any further so you might want to do a double today in addition to grabbing that opt-in for today join the newsletter as well so again just go to angelaraspis.com forward slash newsletter and from then on every resource that i make available to my community will also be there for you but this one today's a cracker so please go and grab that and start those client attraction activities right away that align with your values and the watering holes of those people that you and only you are here to serve. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the podcast and I will be back with you again very soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Your Next Chapter podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please let me know. Pop over to AngelaRaspis.com to subscribe to the show and leave a review. And whilst you're there, you can also enjoy valuable free resources, including show notes and downloads, along with the Next Chapter community, where you can connect with other wholehearted women on the same journey as you. We'd love to welcome and support you as your next chapter unfolds. See you next time.